Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and some of the best things about Eberron are the races that live there. You've got all the old favorites, but with a new coat of paint, and you've got new races with all new features to bring to the table. Hell, I even took a chance to start making guides for each individual Eberron race, and while the mechanical stats are outdated now, there's still good resources for those avid lore folk that want to know more about the world that they live in. The popularity of some of the races is so great that it still haunts me to this very day. But today I'm going to be taking a look at all the new races presented in Eberron, Rising from the Last War. As always, keep in mind that a lot of this is just my opinion, so if you aren't a fan of all this race, profiling, then feel free to play your Eberronian races however you want. And real quick, I want to give a shout out to my new patrons this month. Just Kyrian, Tylee Nall, Tempest, Aless Farrow, Samuel Soto, Keander Jensen, Mario, Anthony Nathaniel Campbell. Thank you so much for pledging your loyalty to the Chappington Empire. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So in the world of Eberron, you'll find a lot of races that you can easily recognize, but perhaps not recognize as well as you should. Humans and dwarves are the most recognizable, with humans taking most of the continent and dwarves carving out a spot for themselves in the mountainous Moror holds. But after that, things start to get hazy. In this world, elves come from another continent entirely pushed to the mainland by a war with the giants. Those elves who stayed behind evolved into this world's version of drow, who aren't evil by default and are prone to actually worshipping a scorpion god instead of their usual spidery folk. Gnomes live in Zalargo and are crafty, deceitful, spiteful folk from the time that they're taught to be like that as children. Dragonborn and tieflings are often mistaken for lizard folk and devils respectively, with dragonborn primarily living in Argonessen, the continent populated by dragons, and tieflings being pushed to the fringes of society, where they are more likely to become warlords and savages than they are to become dashing tricksters, and orcs and halflings are arguably the most different. Halflings live in the Talenta Plains, and instead of subsisting on a quiet and plain life of homelessness, community, and potatoes, the halflings of Eberron ride velociraptors into battle and bring out the mighty T-Rex when the going gets tough. Meanwhile, orcs are not the savage brutes and ingrates that you've been used to seeing, but a perfectly normal society that has helped and continues to help the world through their surprising affinity to druid magic. Hilariously, they were actually instrumental in repelling a space alien invasion, and now the most wild and reckless of them go to the demon waste to take out their frustration not on an unsuspecting village, but on unsuspecting demons. So I think we all know who to thank for our continued existence. Also, wizards took away their intelligence penalty, yay! Then, to finally round it all out, the goblinoids from Volo's Guide make a new appearance due to their importance in Eberron, having been the most powerful empire that ruled the world before the aforementioned space aliens came in and decided to kill all the goblins like it was a tabletop RPG, leaving the goblins of today in a position where they're not the savages they usually are, but just another race that used to rule the world. But beyond that, there are four new Eberron-exclusive races that have evolved throughout the thousands of years of the best setting of D&D, and those are the Kalishtar, the Changeling, the Shifter, and the other one. I forgot the name of it, people don't talk about it a lot. But firstly, the Kalishtar are a duality of normal Melvins and spirit chads that started out as humans until a ghost from the realm of dreams took a look at them and thought, it's free. Now, having bonded with these ghost dream spirit people called Kawori, the Kalishtar operate in a way very similar to an Aesimer's relationship with their diva, traveling the world as enlightened beings, getting pings of insight and emotion from their spiritual ally, and fighting off the forces of evil that stem from the Nightmare Realm. To aid them with this, the Kalishtar are prone to developing mystical psionic powers that can aid them in kicking ass both in the real world and in their dreams. Stat-wise, the Kalishtars get a bonus to both wisdom and charisma, their own Kawori language, advantage on wisdom saves, resistance to psychic damage, a telepathy power that increases its range as you get stronger, and immunity against dream effects, but not sleep effects. The abilities of the Kalishtar help denote it as a psychic-minded race with a lot of mental fortitude, but I do feel like there was room for a little more in the way of powers, since the psychic resistance and dream immunity are very rarely going to come up, and the rest is, while more likely to be used, still not so likely that they can carry the race. It's not a big deal, especially considering the free roleplay hook that you get by having a dream spirit inhabiting your body, but it is something to think about before you accidentally take on the big sleep too soon. Moving on to a race that, no matter what you tell me, is always going to be insanely powerful when it's not in a fight, the Changelings are a race of blank slates with imposter syndrome, trying to decide what kind of person they want to be today. Born with pure white skin, eyes, hair, everything, every Changeling has the innate power to redefine themselves in the most literal way possible, by shapeshifting into anybody that they want. Changelings are about as emotionally muted as their true form, and so they use their power to get a better sense of the world around them, using shapeshifting as a sort of mask to display their emotion in a way that they can't really describe with their empty body. Because of this, shapeshifters get a bonus to charisma and one other stat of their choice, they get the power to shapeshift into a new form for as long as they're alive, and they can be adept at either deception, insight, intimidation, and or persuasion, making them the best infiltrators or spies in the whole of Eberron, since their powers aren't considered magical, but rather just a normal mundane thing that these creatures are capable of, which means their powers aren't detectable by magical means. Unfortunately, changelings don't have any other skills to speak of, so if you wanted to go down the path of a white walker, you're making a very big investment in the world of roleplay, which isn't a bad thing. Eberron was created to really hold up the noir storytelling beats, so you should sort of expect games to be less brass knuckles and more smooth talks. But if you really 
really want to get in on some gritty knuckle dusting action, then you can look no further than the war- uh, wait, no, the Shifter. A Shifter is a human-like person, but with a bestial secret. Long ago in that Shifter's lineage, two of its ancestors boned, but one of those boners was a lycanthrope. Since then, the next of kin have been able to partially transform into some manner of animalistic hybrid, not capable of full transformation, but enough to give the impression of, yep, that's a furry. From boar to bear to cats and dogs, the Shifter is always in tune with its animalistic tendencies, and they feel a constant call to the freedom of the wild, always looking forward for the next journey yet to come. As a playable race, Shifters all have dark vision and the ability to shift into a semi-human animalish form, but practically everything else is dependent on your fursona. Beast Hide Shifters get bonuses to constitution and strength, they're good at athletics, and they get temporary HP and more AC whenever they shift. Longtooth Shifters increase their strength index, they're more intimidating, and they can bite people while shifted as an unarmed attack. Swift Stride Shifters get bonuses to dex and charisma, better acrobatics, and they move faster while shifted to the point where they can jump away from an enemy that gets too close. Finally, Wild Hunt Shifters get wisdom and dexterity bonuses, a knack for survival, and their shifted feature gives them advantage on wisdom checks and makes them immune to criticals. The amount of variety that you get as a shifter is amazing. I always enjoy it when races get sub-races, and I really like that they're all pretty well balanced for each other, so I don't feel like I'm playing an unoptimized game just for picking a race that I like better than the good one. I wish more races would bring the variety to the table. Which brings us to, finally, at the end of the video so that I can cash in all that sweet, sweet viewer retention, the Warforged. Warforged are undeniably the poster child of Eberron. They're plastered literally everywhere on promotional material, you can't get away from Warforged when you talk about Eberron, and people even try to force Warforged into other official settings just because they're so popular. But for those of you who have just hopped on the Eberron train and you don't know what all the hubbub is about, the Warforged is a living machine forged in the forges of war to wage war upon the forces of the Last War's warriors. When the Last War ended, Warforged had nothing to do anymore, so like the Terminator, they all decided to start raising families and gain a sense of morality. They are essentially a refugee veteran allegory that doubles as a metaphor for how unstoppable, soulless killing machines might not actually be anything like that in reality. And now the people of Eberron are in a political discourse over whether robots have rights. Now, when you clank into the game as your own Warforged, you are going to need stats. As a Warforged, you'll have bonuses in Constitution and any one other ability score, advantage and resistance against poison, you don't need to drink, eat, sleep, or even bathe, you're immune to aging effects, and as a point of fact, nobody even knows how long a Warforged is supposed to live for anyway. You don't sleep, you just wait. And you can integrate armor into your actual body that can't be removed while you live. Oh, and you also get a natural plus one to your AC. So compared to the last version of the Warforged before the official update, I've gotta say that I'm really disappointed that they took the sub-races away, for a lot of the same reasons that I like the Shifter having them, but also because the Warforged sub-races had specific inclinations towards types of play that helped specialize in whatever kind of warrior your Warforged happened to be during the last war. Now, I'm not disappointed that they took away the nonsense that was their old armor progression, but I always think that the removal of variety is a sad day. That being said, the Warforged we have now isn't bad, it's perfectly well balanced, and all of my disappointment stems from what might have been. So don't let my naysaying stop you from enjoying the chance to play your D&D version of Robocop. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, don't shapeshift into your significant other when doing private things with your significant other, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can afford oil replacements for my perfectly normal human body eyes. But yeah, Davy out.